Sean McMahon here. This is part 11 of our study of Isaiah 126, the restoration of the judges. We are in the home stretch, folks. We got this part and then one more. 12 parts total for 12 apostles, right? One for every apostle because we are studying the restoration of the judges, which we've discovered is in the apostolic Sanhedrin. Now, if you're lost, you should go check out the first 10 parts if you haven't yet, right? Make sure you subscribe to my channel to be updated when the next part comes out and check out some of the other studies I've done in the past. So the last part, we start asking, if Peter is so important in the church, he's the prime minister of the apostolic Sanhedrin, then where did he go? After Acts 15, what was his role in the church? And importantly, what became of the apostolic Sanhedrin? So let's begin to answer these questions. Now in the last part, we were looking at 1 Corinthians, in which Paul mentions his friend Peter four times, because he's basically trying to prevent the people from forming exclusive sects around himself, around Apollos, and around Peter. And yet in 1 Corinthians 3.6, there's this curious omission of Peter when he says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. And where you'd expect him to mention Peter, because he always does in the previous passages, instead of mentioning Peter, he says, but God has been making it grow. Now, again, in every other mention that Paul makes of himself and Apollos, Peter is included. Why not here? Paul is always keen to create patterns in the rest of his writing. Why did he skip the opportunity to do so here? Why did he exclude Peter in this passage? Well, maybe he didn't. Maybe Paul intentionally put God in the place of Peter's name to compare Peter's apostolic authority to the Lord's. Now, before we tear our robes for blasphemy, let's remember how this apostolic Sanhedrin works. They were instituted by God the Son with Peter at the head. They received power, as the Son promised, on Pentecost with Peter leading the charge not just in Jerusalem, but later in Caesarea, when he received the commission from the Holy Spirit to baptize Cornelius and bring the Gentiles into the church. Listen, Peter is by no means God, obviously, but he is the head of Christ's court of elders, and he has been entrusted with the keys to Christ's kingdom. In short, he is what the ancients called the vicar of Christ. We're going there because that's what he is, right? Hopefully by this point in the study, we're a little more comfortable with that term because we know what it really means. It means he's the prime minister of Christ. He represents Christ's authority in the apostolic Sanhedrin, okay? And 1 Corinthians 3, 6 is deep. It's further proof of this, not that Peter is God, but that Peter's role is neither of planting like Paul's role, nor watering as Apollo's role, but his role is making it grow, which is the prerogative of the Holy Spirit, okay? This is how Peter facilitated the growth of the church in his unique role. It was by Peter's lips, as he said in Acts 15, not that Peter, but God grew his church by calling the Gentiles. And similarly, we're seeing that Peter seems to be a groundskeeper of sorts, neither seeding nor watering, but traveling from church to church with his wife, as we see in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, and his son Mark, as we see in 1 Peter 5, 13. But he's going from church to church, and God is just working through him. God's growing the churches. God, through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, through Peter, right? And so, we can understand that Paul is trying to guide the Corinthians toward greater unity rather than congregate around Paul because of his evangelism, or Apollos because of his local ministry, or Peter because of his prime authority in the apostolic Sanhedrin. So now, it's time to answer the big question. What happened to this apostolic Sanhedrin? Well, as we said in the previous part, the answer lies with Peter and Paul in how their missions are fulfilled and where their stories end. But we've already demonstrated that it's a bit hard to find Peter by name. Rather, Paul usually gives us hints about Peter's whereabouts, and we get just such a hint in the book of Romans. In the 15th chapter, Paul explains that he's wanted to visit the Roman Christians for quite some time, but that he was hindered because his mission, quote, is to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. So Paul's telling us Christ was already known in Rome at this time. How? Well, Paul says it's because someone else laid the foundation. Hmm, who could this be? Might this someone else be someone else who 
after being broken out of prison, absconded to some other place? <laughs> Might this be a someone else who is often shrouded in mystery throughout the New Testament Acts Church period? Okay. Might this be someone who also might be associated with the word foundation? Might this be Peter, of whom it was said, Upon this rock I found my church. Remember previously in our study, we established from Scripture that Christ is the cornerstone. Peter is the foundation. Okay? Well then, I think Paul may have just solved the mystery for us about where that other place was that Peter snuck off to when the angel busted him out of prison. It was Rome. Think about it. How could the Romans have been evangelized if St. Paul had not yet reached them with his ministry to the Gentiles? Well, let's think about where and when this letter was written. Paul was writing this letter from Corinth. So by this time, Peter had already passed the baton of the Gentile mission to Paul. Yet Paul had never been to Rome. So how on earth were the Gentile Christians already in Rome? Well, because the Christians in Rome weren't Gentile. They were Jewish. And on account of them... By the way, Claudius expelled all the Jews who were in Rome. It says that in Acts 18.2. If you want to study the history of that, it has something to do with something called the Crestus controversy, which sounds an awful lot like our pal Jesus. Amen. So this is Paul's occasion for writing the letter to the Romans. The Jews have been expelled. With the Jewish Christians expelled, the church built on Peter's foundation, there was a ripe mission field of Gentiles in the region. And this was Paul's job. This was Paul's mission. So he hoped to do some evangelical work while passing through, as he says, on his way to Jerusalem. But notice how careful he is to show that he's merely visiting. He's being careful not to step over some boundary, isn't he? And it has to do with that someone else who laid that foundation. Now, I should say, the Bible doesn't come right out and say that Peter founded the church in Rome. It's very secretive about him in the biblical writings. And this is because these documents were written while the church was under persecution. This was written in real time. Peter was a fugitive, so no one is broadcasting the, the whereabouts of the head of their organization under persecution, right? He's running around. He's, he's kind of in hiding. He's operating in secrecy. He's on the down low. But we can make inferences based on what we have in the Bible. Admittedly, it's not enough, okay? Similarly, as we get closer to answering the question of the fate of the Apostolic Sanhedrin, we are necessarily getting further and further away chronologically from the biblical narrative. As we've said, the answer about the fate of the Apostolic Sanhedrin is really tied up with the fates of the Apostles, especially that of Peter. But the Bible is silent about Peter's fate. And the reason for this is simple. What happened to Peter's Apostolic Office after he died is a subject about which he couldn't write because he was dead. And Paul, who usually gives us clues about Peter, is equally unable to help us. Why? Because he died alongside Peter. But the Bible doesn't record Paul's death either. If we really want this question answered, we're going to have to start looking at early church history beyond the Bible as recorded beyond the timeline of the books of the New Testament. Instead of the New Testament, we have the witness of the early church fathers. Here's what they said about the fate of Peter and Paul. Gaius, as quoted by Eusebius in his church history, this is from about AD 198, the Gaius quote, says, It's therefore recorded that Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and that Peter likewise was crucified under Nero. This account of Peter and Paul is substantiated by the fact that their names are preserved in the cemeteries of that place, Rome, even to the present day. Origen, in AD 232, says that Peter, at last having come to Rome, he was crucified head downwards, for he had requested that he might suffer this way. There's a lot more about all this in the early church fathers in the first two centuries of the church. That's how Peter died. He was crucified in Rome alongside Paul, who was also beheaded in Rome. They were martyred. All of the apostles were martyred, except for John. And as John was at pains to explain in his gospel, just because he didn't die a martyr didn't mean he didn't die. Jesus foretold, John might outlast all y'all. Doesn't mean that he's immortal, right? John wasn't martyred. The rest of the apostles were. John still died. These men were the apostolic Sanhedrin instituted by Christ. So the final question is, did the apostolic Sanhedrin die with them? 
We're going to find out in the next and final part. Thanks so much for listening. Please share, like, and make sure you've subscribed to my channel. Turn on notifications so that you can be alerted when the next part drops. God bless you.